Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, everybody out there, and um, welcome to the first panel of the second day of the 2021 Euro Money Global Borrowers Conference, a 30th anniversary of this of this splendid event, uh, taking place, of course, not for the first time uh, virtually, rather than at the Hilton Hotel on Park Lane that you all know and love so well. Um, the panel topic in front of us now is a new start for European capital markets. And I think it's fair to say in this context, when we say European, we really mean Eurozone, because that's certainly what we're going to be talking about. Um, but that's the title the panel has been given. We have four excellent panelists here to discuss this topic in various aspects, questions that we have talked a little bit about in preparation that we'll be going through during the course of the panel. Um, let me introduce the panelists. Holger Mertens is, global head, is head of global credit at NICO Asset Management. Uh, Olivier Pujal is senior advisor to the chief financial officer at the European Stability Mechanism, uh, so right at the heart of a number of the things we're going to be talking about. Uh, Shweta Singh is the managing director uh, of global macro and European economics at TS Lombard, the independent economic think tank. Um, and Katarina Utemol is the senior economist for Europe uh, at Allianz uh, Investment Management. So welcome to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, first question, I just want to sort of put a number on this, roughly speaking. And Shweta, uh, I think you might be the person to help to supply it. What do we think? Obviously, there's an awful lot of funding needed in sovereigns and agencies and banks and so on. But I just want to get a sense of what you think the scale of the post-COVID funding needs are for European industry, for, for Eurozone industry, let's say, or for EU industry. Right. Um, so I think uh, I will use the European Commission's forecast because you know, um, they have probably done a lot more work on that than I could. Um, so using their, the, the forecast that they created last year, um, the, the, the losses incurred by European uh, industries is, is likely to exceed 720 billion euros. And that was on their base case, which seemed quite optimistic at that point in time. And these losses could exceed to around 1.2 trillion uh, in the stress scenario. So that's the extent of losses that we are dealing with. Um, and that's within a, a year or so. So as as you see these these the furlough schemes being withdrawn and the, the tax deferrals are no longer in effect, um, the and the and the impact from the, the credit guarantees as they begin to expire from uh, the public credit guarantees, we will begin to see these pressures come through. No, absolutely. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on on that number, but the um, one thing that I I think is is a is a possibility um, a process that's been going on visibly for quite a long time, but the pandemic and the funding need that um, uh, that Shweta has just mentioned. Uh, one thing I think might become more, um, uh, what should I say, more, more notable um, is the shift of European companies away from bank lending or the acceleration of the shift of European companies away from bank lending towards market funding. Um, I don't know what people think about that as an idea. Holger, do, do you see that as a, a obviously from your, from from Germany, where obviously the, the house bank tradition is still alive and well, but nonetheless, bond markets have become a more used financing option for corporates, even even in Germany. Well, I mean, if if you're looking back on the last ten years for for large caps and also for mid caps, you you have seen this trend already moving away from relationship ben, uh, um, lending and and using different sources for funding. But I think for SMEs, it will be still pretty difficult to to move away from from the relationship bank because I mean, usually the the amount of debt and 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 small cap needs wouldn't justify a bond issue. So I guess for for large caps and and huge parts of the mid cap sector the bond market is is has become already an important source and will be increasingly an important source but i think for 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 smes it will be really difficult to to move away from 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 banking uh from the banking sector for to 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 get funding katarina what what's your view on this 
Yeah, maybe um, to start off again with the financing needs, I think as Sweta said, absolutely the losses play a role. Um, buffers have been used up. Um, and on the other hand, um, you know, we're facing um, a rapid recovery. Firms need to prepare for that. So they need financing for that. And in addition, beyond the immediate short term, you know, they also need to ensure um, that they can um, adapt to changing economic needs. So to participate in the digital as well as the green transition, and that's going to cost money. That's uh, that will, um, you know, also require huge investments. So how do we get this money? It's it's great news that we have, um, you know, we expect by the end of the year, even after the consumption boom, still to have 500 billion in excess savings from households. So that's wonderful. You know, the money is there, but can it be transformed? Um, and we think that uh, capital markets in Europe still remain underdeveloped, so they cannot play this, you know, very necessary role at a time when banks also remain under stress. So that's a concern. Yeah, absolutely. Olivier, I mean, do you see, I, I've been talking about this topic now for about 15 years, I suppose, at conferences, and I've often referred to it as the Americanization of European corporate finance, um, by which I mean switching, not relying on bank loans, uh, but going to markets. Do you, do you see this as an accelerating trend? Well, first of all, I, I fully agree with just what has been said. I mean, um, uh, companies in Europe are very dependent on banks. EU capital markets, capital markets in the EU uh, provide inadequate equity financing and that situation weighs on the development of companies within the EU, especially SMEs and uh, startup businesses. And the Capital Market Union initiative that was launched uh, in 2015 needs to ensure that EU companies can access more stable and long-term financing across the whole EU. Our chief financial officer and chief economist at the ESM wrote an extensive ESM blog uh, last June on that topic, explaining what needs to be done. Uh, I encourage anyone interested in SMU to read it. But regarding the financing of SMEs and startup businesses, I think in Europe we need to develop venture capital and support private equity investors who today lack information about companies from uh, other EU countries and then tend to operate only at national level. And that's that's a, a strong barrier. Absolutely. The Capital Markets Union initiative should also, I think, facilitate the access to public uh, equity that too often remains uh, deterred by far-reaching obligations. These obligations are fit for the purpose of uh, uh, big caps, not necessarily relevant for uh, SMEs. You're absolutely if, right, Olivier. And forgive me, but you, you, you've... You obviously already made the segue I was about to make, make to talk about CMU and Capital Markets Union. And, and one other element which just does pop into my mind is, do you remember there was a, um, there were a number of initiatives towards sort of aggregated SME loans being securitized? Um, I think Commerce Bank upset the, uh, the Fanbrief Association by doing a covered bond in, in using those kinds of assets as collateral. Um, I guess we might see some more of those kinds of structures, but you, you rightly say, you rightly date um, CMU to 2015. Uh, and in fact, um, the commission on its website says the need said at the time, September 2015, the need to build a true single market for capital to strengthen Europe's economy and stimulate investment to create jobs is a priority. Now it's nearly six years after that. So um, the SME element of that, where you would have you know, I remember people talking about, you know, you have Dutch, a Dutch fund lending money to a Spanish furniture manufacturer, uh, exporter. Um, that feels to me still as far away from reality as it was then. And um, let's stick with you, Olivier. Why has it taken so long? What are the obstacles? And, and when could we see some action? Um, that's a lot of questions and a very brief answer, please. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you, Chris. Uh, well, the, the Capital Market Union Initiative was, was part of the European answer to the global financial crisis a decade ago, alongside the creation of the Banking Union, it aimed at developing a true single market for capital. No question but that there have been some big achievements since 2015. I would uh, uh, mention, for example, the, the introduction of a new passport for financial services, or the establishment of the European supervisory authorities, 
or the creation of the usage vehicle investment that is so important for the fund industry in Europe. But you're right to say that because of its complexity, the project may have lost uh, momentum since 2015. Mm. But with the pandemic, the transition towards a sustainable economy and the departure of Europe's main financial centre, London, have brought back CMU to the top of the European agenda. When appointed president of the European Commission, Jules von der Leyen, set the relaunching of the CMU as a key priority for a mandate. The CMU will be an enabler to deliver on other top priorities, such as the European Green Deal and the creation of a digital single market. So uh, in that context, the, the, the Commission published uh, a new CMU action plan uh, uh, back in September last year. And that plan contains plenty of concrete actions to review CMU, in particular for SMEs. It is now up to policymakers to implement them. Yeah, no, I, I saw that. Um, Katarina, do you have a do, are you, do you share Olivier's stated optimism uh, that this is a soon come thing? Um, the European Banking Union got off to a reasonably quick start and, and was relatively trouble free in its implementation, but CMU has not been like that at all. What's your opinion? Yeah, I yeah. would agree more with that statement. I think I'd say that um, if anything, the last few years since 2015 have taught us the lesson that, um, you know, the backward looking approach to CMU. So where you try to overcome deep rooted obstacles to market integration by changing existing rules is doomed to fail. And I think that, um, you know, even though we're faced with the crisis, you know, um, or wake up calls such as Brexit or now COVID, you know, where where we need, you know, CMU more than ever. And everybody agrees CMU is a wonderful thing to have, um, but we're just not, you know, the approach um, is not working. I think it's time to change course. I think we need to have a more forward looking approach, define the rules for the future of finance um, and, uh, and not, you know, backward looking, trying to harmonize everything. So what's really important is to get the, um, regulatory framework right for, you know, um, for the future of finance um, in Europe. And I think, um, uh, you know, one option here, for instance, could also be um, we are pursuing the route of the 28th regime, you know, rather than trying to iron everything out. I think this approach should be acknowledged. It has failed and we should get over that. Okay. Um, Holger, how optimistic are, are you about CMU? Well, first of all, looking into the action plan, I think there are a lot of important points which which uh, the EU brought up, like, I mean, harmonization of bank bankruptcy law is, is pretty important, particularly for a bond investor, not just looking into the indenture in each time, then judging if, if what, what means German insolvency law or what means French insolvency law for us. Um, I mean, the, the speed of this developments, um, well, I think there was some some lack of ambition in, in the action plan in a way that there weren't hard deadlines set. So this is probably gives politicians a chance to to move away from from the points where, where there will be arguments. So, I mean, good, good points made, but again, I mean, a bit in the direction of Katharina. So implementation will, will be seen. I think there could have been more ambition from, from the commission. And also, I think a CMU probably would, would ideally work in, in tandem with, with the banking union. And, and this is another point where, where speed is probably not, not, not at the highest at the moment. I mean, I think there was last week a meeting, which again, showed investors that that there will be more time needed to get a banking union done uh, as things like uh, a guarantee deposit scheme are, are are a hard nut to to crack for 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 politicians and particularly in germany which which is stumbling with this point but yeah but you, you have to agree there's been much more progress on on banking union than on market union. um i think um Shreta, let's let's turn to you i mean there's a sort of drumbeat in the background of many, many conversations at the moment, which is that pandemic, awful as it has been in, in all sorts of different ways, uh, and still is, of course, um, is going to be the catalyst for positive and beneficial change. Uh, and in a sort of e in an EU context, a lot of people are talking about, we're going to come on to talk about um, things like perhaps the new... Um, the new markets, the new issuances, the new the new bonds, the new borrowing entities are going to be a catalyst for fiscal union, uh, for transfer union, for all of those kinds of things, for political union. Now, some people welcome that and, and others, of course, don't. But there is this feeling that 
pandemic will cause uh, good things or at least big things to happen. Is Capital Markets Union going to be one of them? Um, yes. Uh, so, the as you said, you know, the pandemic has really um, surprised us in a bit on the positive side in terms of the the efforts made by the the ECB to begin with um, to to embark on the the PEP program, which sort of you know moved away from all the restrictions that its conventional QE program was grappling with. So that was a, a bold step. And then after that, we had the, the tremendous progress on the recovery fund. So the pandemic has sort of opened up these new um, new positive uh, uh, venue, uh, new positive um, steps for the for, for the euro area in particular. Um, but we are, you know, to 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 say that we are really close uh, to a capital markets union would be um, would be a bit 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 too optimistic at this point in time um, because first the recovery fund is not a permanent feature for instance um, of the uh, of the for the for the for Europe uh, it's still it's still uh, portrayed as a crisis uh, measure so you know we first need to make something like this a more permanent feature and sort of it it leads itself into taking more concrete steps on broader avenues like the capital markets union and as Holger was saying initially um, these th capital market union banking union fiscal union they all move together um, so they can't really move in isolation. We do see positive steps on on each of these sides, but it's not sufficient to say, you know, we are really uh, very close towards a capital market markets union, for instance. Is, is that is that the real problem? Have you put your finger on the main issue that capital markets union is 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 a little bit of a fiction without fiscal union, and without, for example, things like Holger mentions, like like um, uh, harmonised bankruptcy laws, incredibly important. Exactly. So I think we we can't have these things working in, in in silos. You know, these have to move together. And for instance, the we need to harmonise. Um, there needs needs to be more progress in terms of harmonising regulations, be it on 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 taxation and on solvency laws. Also, um, a lot of progress needs to be made on the the supervisory framework. Um, yes, the the EBA is a great pro great step for the for the banking union. But when you actually look at the cross border lending. Uh, in, in Europe, it's actually not moved that far in spite of um, progress on the banking union. Um, and that brings us back to lack of confidence in, in, in say, in, in what we were talking about earlier, the, the depositors insurance scheme. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is there needs to be homogene homogeneity across the board um, for, for the capital market union to come, come, come in true force. Sure. Um, as it, I'm apolog I apologise, the lights have gone out here. That's because it's a green office, uh, and unless people walk around in it, it thinks it's empty, uh, and so the lights go off. Um, somebody might come in and turn them on in a moment. Olivia, I think I'd better ask you to respond um, to what the others have just said, because not a great sense of optimism coming across uh, from Holger, Catalina, and Schroeter. Yeah, I, I hear the criticism and I understand some of them. I'm fully aware we are not there yet for the CMU, but I would, would not underestimate the, the will of the new commission. Yeah. And the new action plans, again, contain plenty of very concrete measures that when put together could, be, could make a big step forward. Mm -hmm. But at the SM, we, we indeed we support um, a, a view based on five key measures that would be game changers for the CMU. Uh, we think that for the CMU, we need some big changes and not only step-by-step -step regulatory amendment. We think this is not big enough. We think that first, uh, within the EU, and to make CMU happen, we need to harmonize more market supervision under the umbrella of the uh, ESMA or the other um, European competent authorities. Uh, to make sure that EU rules are implemented in a more consistent way than today. Second, we think that the development of ESG finance to turn Europe into an ESG global hub would be a game changer for the, for the CMU. Uh, third, we also strongly support the reviving of security, securitization to alleviate banks' balance sheets. And in that regard, if you uh, read the, the, um, the action plan uh, of the Commission, you will see that there are lots uh, of measures in that, uh, in that support. 
Uh, fourth, we need to develop equity finance for SMEs as well. And third, if you might be finished, I think we need to promote a European safe asset to support financial stability and NG, NG EU recovery fund goes into the right direction. You, you, you have you mentioned several things that we absolutely are, are going to talk about. Um, and I, I, I want to come back to you specifically because you mentioned it in your earlier remark, um, the venture capital private equity industry and the potential, obviously one might look to that source of funding uh, to seed the creation of some new European tech giants. I mean, obviously we, we are, you know, we're talking on a Cisco platform, but we might have been talking on a Zoom platform. And, you know, a couple of years ago, almost nobody had heard of Zoom. And now, of course, it's a very, very big thing. And it's a pity that it's not a European thing. Um, but you mentioned securitization. I do just want to pick up quickly on that and ask the two fund management people here. Uh, securitization obviously has, has continued, has boomed and, and so on in, in since the global financial crisis. But it, it is at least one of the actors that caused the global financial crisis. Um, is, it, is it still in any sense thought of perhaps by policymakers rather than by market people as a slightly toxic asset class? Katerina, do you have any sense of that just quickly? No, I think it's um, it's a yeah a further instrument. Let's say that is actually uh, has an important role, and I would say that it doesn't. It has it has dropped the the toxic quote. Let's say I don't I don't think we view it in that light anymore. No. Okay, Holger, you uh, Holger, you agree? Yeah, I, I would yeah. agree. I mean, it it was part of the eight crisis, but this is now so thirteen years thirteen years ago. So. Okay. Um, I, I agree with Katerina. Seems quite recent to, to a lot of us, but of course, many people have built their whole careers since, since then. So uh, um, let's talk about this equity financing thing for uh, SMEs and, and seed capital for tech companies and so on, um, which Olivier has, has nicely teed up. Um, Shweta, are you, a, are you a hopeful that that kind of financing could become more embedded in the European corporate <laughs> finance scene? Um. I would like to be more hopeful, but given what I have, what the data I'm working with right now, there is limited optimism. Um, what's interesting is, is uh, since the pandemic, we have seen a surge in, in debt issues. Um, they have they have broken all previous records. Unfortunately, we can't really say the same for for equity equities. Um, and I guess that's that's a shame, really, because when you think about the the, the large financing needs that we discussed early on early, early on in the conversation that these uh, that the, the that the European industry has um, we think about you know how do you meet these financing needs the, the sovereign balance sheet is already under pressure and that's not taking into account the the huge amount of public guarantees that they have put in place um, the banking sector which which firms and businesses rely on to a large extent is under pressure if you look at the your if, if you look at the, the ecb's bank lending survey in spite of all the support provided through debt moratoria um uh the the guarantees and telfros the banking the, the banks uh, are still tightening their supply of credit uh the credit standards for uh, are still tightening for these banks then you're left with a private source of funding, um, and that brings us to the huge um, uh, savings that households are sitting on, which Katerina pointed out to early, early in the conversation. And we need to use these savings um, to finance these funding needs. Unfortunately, uh, the problem is, and also again, institutional investors need, you know, they, they are also sitting on these uh, vast amount of savings, which they can channel to uh, to these um, industries through their through equities. Unfortunately, we don't really see that sort of framework yet um, in the uh, in Europe uh, to facilitate that. So, um, when we see more progress in terms of harmonizing laws, supervisory regulations, more cross border flow of capital by providing more insurance to depositors. We will uh, will definitely make progress towards that, but unfortunately, at this point in time, um, I'm a bit uh, I'm not that optimistic. Really, back to the same thing, Katerina. I mean, it, you you could almost say that the definition of a stock market was a mechanism to turn the savings of individuals and families to productive industrial use. That might almost be you know what it says on the tin. Um, how do you feel the prospects are looking for this for? SMEs and, and indeed specifically perhaps in the tech sector to get funded in new ways in, in the EU? 
Um, yeah, I would also uh, remain pessimistic here. Usually I'm not that pessimistic always, but on CMU, I think um, <laughs> it's just not easy. Um, so I, I would say that um, if you want to phrase it in a more optimistic way, I would say that the current situation is actually a unique opportunity. Yeah, we could, um, you know, implement uh, regulations that you know make it more attractive um, to switch from debt financing to equity financing, right? For instance, tackling the tax advantage, I think a disadvantage. I think that's in the works now a little bit. Or, you know, we could otherwise, um, uh, you know, tweak tax policies and regulation. Um, but uh, it's just that in the short run, it, you know, we will continue to see this high bank dependency of SMEs and we're not going to have these equity or equity like instruments and that's a concern it's too little too late and it's a risk for the recovery you know the the corporates that were at the epicenter of this crisis you know are have to deal with more debt and and have high investment needs as i said earlier also for the digital and green recovery and um that's uh, it's a concern also you know to make the green deal um uh, for instance a success so um yeah i don't see us moving in the right direction and in fact every day that we're not working on this you know from morning to evening essentially and um, we are also falling more behind china and the us right on these very important um um issues such as the digital economy for instance mm, and that okay. has consequences for our strategic autonomy also so that's okay. where i leave it <laughs> absolutely um okay let, let's let's switch topics now a little bit of course they're all related topics and holger i'm going to turn to you first on this um, I was listening to an interview the other day with Johannes Hahn of the European Commission, um, who was making the point that the new EU, next-gen EU um, bond explosion uh, is a one-off. It's a one-off program. It's not a permanent thing. Um, that seems to me a, a political statement on, on his part, which perhaps reflects the country he comes from. Uh, rather than a, a wider view. Um, I can see Olivier is sort of slightly smiling as I, as I say these words. I'm choosing them carefully. Um, but is, is this the moment when Europe became sovereign, do you think? Well, I guess if he would have said something different, then the, the red alarm lights would have flashed up in Berlin. Um, I think ideally you probably wanted to have a kind of treasury function in the EU as you have in, 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 in the US, but I guess this is a process which needs to be carefully managed. And, and so I think for the time being, it's, it's a one-off temp uh, function to, to solve the crisis. If this will evolve into something more meaningful, will be seen down the line, depends on, on also how the, how the uh, political scene will develop in, in Germany after the election. Um, yeah, but, but for now, it's, 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 it's a temporary, temporary um, feature. Olivier, um, things which start out as temporary features do have a, a habit of becoming permanent. Uh, I mean, one thinks of quantitative easing, for example, which was an emergency measure which is still with us. Um, what's your sort of headline view on the whole um, NGEU, RRF, um, borrowing? I mean, obviously, you're, you know, you're part of it. You're one, absolutely one of the actors in this. What's your kind of headline view of it? Give us that first. Well, I think regarding the, the 750 billion uh, uh, NGEU, or Recovery and Resilience Facility, uh, it is a huge step forward for the EU. We, nobody would have imagined such an envelope, such a fund, uh, before the pandemic. You have to remember that this uh, envelope will be funded through bonds backed by the EU budget. And that was accepted by uh, the most reluctant countries in Europe. One of them was mentioned a minute ago. So this is a huge step forward. Nobody would have believed in it before. And that was not the only step forward. Uh, prior to this uh, uh, recovery and resili resilience facility, the EU, the European Investment Bank, and the ESM by institution unlocked very early when the crisis started a 540 billion package of loans and guarantees to support jobs, businesses, and finance additional health expenditures. So I think the answer of the uh, European institution was massive and was a huge step forward. Nobody would have thought 
about it before. And I don't even mention the, the policy of the ECB that reacted very, very shiftly and strongly by lowering its interest rates or increasing very significantly the size of its bonds purchase program, the PEP program, which accounts today for 1,000, uh, more than 1,000, 1,850 billion euros. This is massive. I hear some commentators saying that Europe has not done uh, as much as the US. I think this is very unfair because first you have to remember that European answers uh, come on top of what national governments do. And in Europe, we, we all know that we have a welfare system much more developed than in the US. And if you sum up everything, in 2020, uh, Europe, the EU, and national governments unlocked 3.7 trillion euros to support the economy. That support will continue, possibly through the rollout of the uh, next EU generation fund over the coming years. I cannot tell you if this is this will be become permanent or not. I have no idea. I don't know at this stage. It's not the, the project, but Europe has made huge step forwards, and uh, the European answer has been of the same magnitude as in the US. You're, you're I absolutely think. right to, to highlight the the fact that exist pre existing social safety nets and so forth, the social security mechanisms, um, which simply do not exist in the US need to be taken into account here. This is a 100% valid point. Um, Katerina, you, your company at least buys a lot of bonds. Um, how do you see this, these new developments, this new development of a new European safe asset um, affecting, just leave aside the sort of macro or, or even political aspects of it for a moment, how does it affect markets um, in the sense of, you know, reference rates, collateral, pricing, um, this sort of implied piercing of the sovereign ceiling, which was always a, you know, always a, a kind of a key metric that people looked at. How do you see it affecting those kinds of things? Yeah, maybe just one sentence on the political course, implication, because yeah. I'm German too, so I feel I, I, I need to have a view here also. Um, I think that uh, I've called it once um, um, a fiscal union trial balloon. Um, I think this could be something, you know, a blueprint for how EU funds can be used in the future to, you know, to to reform economies. And um, I here the country to watch is Italy. You know, if the funds are properly um, implemented and have a you know positive impact on the growth potential in Italy, for instance, um, I think that you know, uh, as you said, also tools. You know, they come out, the genie is out of the bottle, I think, in the next recession or if there's need or maybe even if there's political will, um, I think that we could have a reoccurring um, uh, situation of, um, uh, of, um, uh, yeah, of, a, of, a, of funds that are spent to um, activate reforms. So that was the political part. Um, on, uh, on capital markets, yeah, building... Um, uh, building a, uh, a curve essentially here. This is really something that will help also uh, the euro, you know, in its uh, international role, its international standing. Um, you know, it remains to be seen for that. It would really, you know, we cannot really just have this as a temporary one off. So um, uh, uh, for this to support the um, uh, the role of the euro, um, I think th this is the beginning and let's see where we're going. Um, from the plans that are on the table at the moment, um, yeah, it will just be a temporary boost uh, to the euro as a, you know, in its in its standing in the global, let's say, currency order. But but I mean that that's a very good point as well that the raising of the international into the internationalization of the euro, which is a stated policy aim that we've we've all read and heard. Um, but but just to stick with you for a second, what about those? What about things like the, the it will obviously. Um, change balances in the market completely uh, there'll be new pricing rate new reference rates and so forth um the market's all ready for that that would just all go without a hitch yeah i mean uh, what we see is that uh, you know if there's a really new safe asset it could weigh on peripheral uh, spreads for instance you know um this could come as a concern i think but uh, i could also imagine that here a uh, fiscal and monetary policy will remain close collaborators so um that for instance uh, uh, going forward the ecb may announce that it will um uh, buy you know some of these um uh, eu bonds um uh, as part of its supranational um 
uh, buying That's spree, true. let's say. Um, so I think uh, overall it really helps to um, yeah to reinforce the um, the economic um, or the the fiscal and economic response of the of the eurozone. Okay. I think the initial yeah. is initial launch of the the bond were bonds were a success so far, so they were yeah, absorbed yeah, by the market pretty pretty easy. Um, just to highlight this. Yeah, certainly. I mean, they, the debut debut was was very successful. Shweta, um, comment on what others have said and on, on the fundamental question. But I, I also just like because you're the independent economist here, for you to give a sort of five word answer to the implied question which Katerina has just raised, which is. Are fiscal and monetary policy now the same thing? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to put it this way. I don't think it's become very, very clear, um, and never has this been so clear as during the pandemic, that monetary policy cannot have um, the same impact in the absence of fiscal support. I mean, that's that's very clear. Um, and that brings us to the, you know, the, the, the safe asset thing, and it ties in so well with the with the monetary policy and fiscal policy working together. Um, now, the safe asset story, as, as Katrina was saying, at the moment, it's temporary. And for, for it to have a genuine impact in a boost in the supply of uh, safe assets, and for that to have an impact on the role of euro as a global funding currency, you need that to become a more permanent feature of European or European fiscal policy. Um, and for that to happen successfully, you need to see fiscal boost. Um, and that would create, uh, uh, and it could, you know, theoretically speaking, it could re relate to, it could create some indigestion in the market. And that's where you need the, the support from, from the monetary policy as well. Um, and that, that sort of leads to a very virtuous, positive virtuous cycle of improved collateral, uh, better pricing, um, and also just less reliance of um, of European exporters on, on on dollar for to finance their working capital needs. And the moment we start to think about reducing the role of the dollar in the in the global funding market, you start to you you start to become more positive in terms of the the pressure on emerging markets. Uh, when the do uh, from a strengthening dollar, um, and that's all, and because Europe ha still has this big current account surplus, it's just a reflection of how much they are dependent on external demand. So when you when we break the link from strong dollar to weak uh, emerging market uh, demand, uh, it sort of boosts European growth as well. So I think it's beneficial in so many ways, but this cannot really function unless we have a massive support from fiscal policy and a backstop from from the ECB. Mm. Um, well, the so it was a bit is, of a diplomatic answer, but um, no, well, uh, NGEU, as we know, is 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 time limited anyway. It's not going to go beyond twenty fifty eight. Um, uh, I'm not sure that I will be there to see it. Um, Holger, you were going to say something. No, no, I'm 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 good. Oh, sorry, I thought I thought you put your hand up, um, Olivier. Um, what do you think of what? Sorry, we, this is a pattern, isn't it? I keep coming back to you and asking you what you think of what the others have said, but the others all tend to be a little bit more um, in, in agreement and, and not necessarily in agreement with things that you've said. So I'm afraid it's a bit inevitable. Um, what do you think of their comments? No, I think all their comments are completely valid. Um, we need in Europe a deep and liquid facet. It is a key component of an official capital market. It enables investors to shift their portfolios away from risky exposures rapidly and at medium cost. In Europe, uh, government bonds from core euro area countries have traditionally played that role of a safe asset. Don't forget that they are also complemented by ESM, my institution, and European Investment Bank bonds. And also EU bonds. EU uh, was, uh, has been issued uh, some bonds for, for years before the NGEU yeah. was in uh, so we need a, We need a bigger safe asset. There isn't, we need more of them, for sure. First, to support financial stability, uh, to enable banks, European banks, to substitute their holdings of national government bonds with that European safe asset. Uh, with such diversification, we would reduce the spillover of risk between the sovereigns and the banking sector, known as the bank sovereign nexus. That you Absolutely. We also need a, a, a European safe asset um, to uh, reduce the dependency of the private cost, uh, the private borrowing uh, sector uh, cost, 
which are referred to sovereign yields. Um, more European safe assets would reduce the vulnerability of the private sector to re-rating of credit sovereigns. And finally, of course, uh, a deeper and more liquid safe asset would contribute to the international role of the euro. We are not there yet. That's a no, fact. We are not. Of course, it's the first. It's the first time that investors have been able to buy uh, European euro safe assets at the short end of the curve as well. I mean, it, there's undoubtedly yeah. it, it it creates a whole new layer of liquidity, whole new secondary market. Uh, fantastic. From that point of view, without question, uh, I think that the sort of macro and political things underneath it. Uh, are, are, are more perhaps what gives some of the panelists concern. Um, right, we, we've got um, two and a half minutes left, so I'm just going to ask each, each of you really, really quickly to tell me what is the answer to the question um, that uh, was the last one on my list that I distributed to you. We didn't get as predicted to all of those questions, um, but the, this pandemic has obviously shown that markets and the global financial system are pretty resilient, um, you know, that, that's been good. Um, what's the next big risk that we can't see? You've got 30 seconds each to tell us. Holger, let's start with you. Well, I, I didn't saw the pandemic coming and I, I certainly don't know what the next next thing is. So what we focus is on, on creating robust portfolios which halfway work through this crisis. I mean, one, one thing of concern is clearly what, what the uh, move to sustainability means for some, some sectors. I'm a some bit concerned about the, the oil majors and if they will be still double A in, in the future or if this is moving to a triple B, double B industry because of the changes. Okay, so Holger's worried about his oil stocks. Fair enough. That's okay. Um, Katerina. Um, I agree. Probably everything that we say now will be trumped by something that we're not, you know, that we're not mentioning. Um, but um, the other thing I think that is interesting is something that we see every day, namely the exuberance in markets. Um, and um, we see it. And I think this is actually one of the key concerns for us. So it's like a, it's basically an endogenous or risk that's endogenous to markets. Um, there has been a lot of, um, to me at least, concerns around financial stability also as a result of uh, the loose monetary policy. And um, yeah, we think markets have gone a little bit wild and uh, there's a risk um, time, for this time, to end. Time to take away the punch bowl. Olivier, 20 seconds from you, please. Yeah, well, I could be very quick. I think we are not out from the pandemic crisis yet, unfortunately. Of course, we are more confident than some weeks ago, thanks to the success of the vaccine campaign, notably in Europe. But as long as the vaccine has not been rolled out uh, to the entire world, we are still facing the risk that it comes back and then with the new social, financial, and economic. Of course. Uh, now, Shweta, I've always said to economists, make a prediction, because if you're right, you can remind us, and if you're wrong, nobody will remember. So you've got 15 <laughs> seconds to make one. Um, oh, okay. I'll, I'll say, I think the bigger, the big risk, um, not thinking about, you know, the, the big, uh, stuff like pandemic the bigger risk for me at the moment seems to be this diverging growth path between the us um, and europe um, and perhaps the rest of uh, perhaps other emerging markets as well and because global assets are priced off us yields i think it could lead to uh, disruptions um, and that will test the resolve of, of the ecb for instance um, and and european european authorities to step in uh, even as they even as uh, europe has went gone past its uh, pandemic phase. So I think that for me uh, is something I'm monitoring. Shweta, thank you very much indeed. Shweta, Katerina, Holger, Olivier, it's been a great pleasure. I'm sure the audience have enjoyed it enormously. Thank you very much indeed. The next panel is on Asia's uh, changing role in the global economy. Uh, so we move over to the other side of the world. But thank you very much for joining me, all of you panelists and you out there in the audience. Thank you.